Cameron defiant as MPs question him over his family's financial affairs. After publishing his tax details, he says other potential prime ministers should do likewise. Tonight, the Chancellor and the Labour leader released their tax returns, but Mr Corbyn was fined for submitting his late. Also on the programme, Aisha, Aisha Smith's mother is jailed for at least 24 years. The judge calls her devious and selfish. A new owner for Tata Steel in Scunthorpe and a new pledge tonight on Port Talbot. And hail the master, Danny Willett tells us about waking up as Britain's golfing superstar. First thing I did, got out of bed, made sure the jacket was still there, no one had come in and stolen it overnight. This is the ITV Evening News with Mark Austin and Charlene White. Good evening. David Cameron stood up in front of a packed House of Commons today to defend both his own tax affairs and his late father's business reputation. He said aspiration and wealth creation were not dirty words, but the Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, called the Prime Minister's statement a masterclass in distraction and accused him of failing to give full details. Mr Cameron also said all future Prime Ministers and Chancellors and their opposition shadows should publish their tax returns. That's exactly what both the Chancellor, George Osborne, and Jeremy Corbyn did today. Our political editor, Robert Peston, was in the Commons. David Cameron, after a week prevaricating about his interest in a Panama trust set up by his father and whether he or his family ever avoided tax, today took on his accusers. Mr Speaker, there have been some deeply hurtful and profoundly untrue allegations made against my father. This investment fund was set up overseas in the first place because it was going to be trading predominantly in dollar securities. There are thousands of these investment funds. Even a quick look shows that the BBC, the Mirror Group, Guardian newspapers, and to pick one council entirely at random, Islington, all have these sorts of overseas investments. I'm sure, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister will join me in welcoming the outstanding journalism that has gone into exposing the scandal of destructive global tax avoidance revealed by the Panama Papers. What they have driven home, Mr Speaker, is what many people have increasingly felt. There is now one rule for the super-rich and another for the rest. Now, last week may have felt like near tragedy for David Cameron, but today we saw farce. Maybe Dodgy Dave will answer it now. I think he knows the word beginning with D and ending in Y that he inappropriately used. I still refer to him as Dodgy Dave. I order the Honourable Member to withdraw immediately from the House for the remainder of this day's sitting. History has been made by David Cameron's publication of his income and tax that has been followed by other party leaders and the Chancellor. But we might regret this new requirement that our leaders tell us about their finances if it deters the next generation of talent from going into Parliament. Well, Robert, he obviously won't silence his most bitter critics, but has Mr Cameron, do you think, done enough to put a lid on all this for now? I think his own position may be stabilised. He certainly was extraordinarily confident in the Commons today after his horrendously wobbly week. But his attempt to limit the disclosure of tax returns to himself the opposition leader, the chancellor and the shadow chancellor, I think looks a bit naive. I mean, why on earth is it relevant for us to know the tax details of the chancellor, but not the foreign secretary and the home secretary and the other members of the cabinet? So I do think that we are now into a process of increasing amounts of disclosures of the private financial details of ministers and MPs. That will make them terribly anxious. As I said in my piece, it may put off would-be politicians from going into Parliament. And there's another thing. There are thousands and thousands of additional Panama papers to be trawled through. And I have to say, I think it's highly likely we will see some other well-known names, perhaps other well-known names from this place, Parliament, humiliated by what is uncovered. All right, Robert, thank you very much indeed. 
Sentencing her mother to life in prison today, the judge called the murder of little Aisha Smith the grossest breach of trust. Catherine Smith was told she must serve at least 24 years for stamping her daughter to death in the child's own bedroom. The family of Aisha's natural father said social services should be held to account for what happened. Ben Chapman was in court. She was known as AJ, a delightful but defenceless little girl, in the words of the judge, whose life was brutally snuffed out in her own bedroom amongst her toys. Catherine Smith stamped on her daughter, breaking her ribs and tearing her heart. She cried and shook her head as she was sentenced. You were a devious, manipulative, selfish young woman who would stop at nothing to get your own way, the judge told her. Aisha was killed in her own home by her own mother. This is the grossest breach of trust. Listening in court was AJ's natural father, Ricky Booth, and his family. Whilst we are pleased with the outcome, we are far from happy, and no amount of time or sentence will replace the loss of watching AJ grow up. This has left us feeling very distraught and frustrated as we made calls to social services several weeks before AJ passed, warning them that she was at serious risk. They'd shown social workers these photos of injuries on AJ's face months before she died. The attacks only grew more savage as time went on. The judge said the violence took place under the noses of social services, who visited the family's flat six times in AJ's last month alone. A serious case review is now underway into her death, but the local MP has called for a public inquiry. Jailing AJ's stepfather, Matthew Rigby, for three and a half years, the judge said she might have been alive today if he'd reported what Smith was doing. I think she, she's manipulative and I think she manipulated professionals and I think she manipulated Matthew Rigby. Catherine Smith has shown no remorse nor offered any explanation for killing her daughter and no regret for the suffering she put AJ through over the course of her short life. Ben Chapman, ITV News, Burton-on-Trent. The government's revealed tonight it's considering what it calls co-investing with a buyer to save the Port Talbot steel plant in South Wales. It came after more than 4,000 jobs were saved when a buyer was found for Tata Steel's huge plant in Scunthorpe. Our business editor, Joel Hills, reports from North Lincolnshire. Scunthorpe has been at the heart of the British steel industry for 125 years. This vast site has seen glory days, but today it's all about survival. The deal that will keep the blast furnaces burning here values the business at just one pound. Staff have had to make sacrifices, but the mood as the morning shift clocked off was upbeat. I'm real pleased about the takeover, obviously. It's just come on the news. It's spot on. It means everything, really, because if I don't have a job, I can't provide for my family. Greybull Capital has signed a binding agreement to take on Tata's main works in Scunthorpe, as well as sites in Teesside, Workington and York. Greybull plans to invest £400 million in the business, safeguarding 4,400 jobs. But staff are being asked to accept a temporary pay cut of 3% and a permanently less generous new pension scheme. The Scunthorpe plant here is part of Tata Steel's long products division. It makes railway tracks as well as steel rods, girders and beams for the construction industry. It also now makes money. The rest of Tata's British business, which employs almost 12,000 people, is loss making, which makes it a much harder sell. But the company today formally invited would-be buyers to come forward. As it stands, there are no bidders for Port Talbot or any of the other remaining plants. Tonight, the government is offering taxpayer loans to help attract investors. It looks bleak, but Tata is trying to sound optimistic. Uh, we will reach out to as many people as our advisors recommend um, to find a, a new owner for this business. Let that process uh, proceed. Scunthorpe's new owners plan to revive the name British Steel, a business that was once in public hands. But the government continues to rule out renationalisation. Joel Hills, ITV News in Scunthorpe. Well, let's talk to our political correspondent, Lewis Vaughan Jones, now. And Lewis, what more can you tell us about the business secretary's announcement about Port Talbot? 
Well, the challenge for the business secretary is to keep uh, that steelworks open and going. Ideally, they want a private buyer to come in. But he used an intriguing phrase. He says the government would consider co-investing with a buyer on commercial terms. Now, what does that mean? Well, in the first instance, it could just mean commercial loans. But a source within the department says tonight that in the extreme, it could mean the government taking a minority equity stake. Now, is it nationalisation, a word that the Conservatives are pretty uncomfortable with? It's not certainly not full nationalisation, uh, but it is at least nudging towards that direction. It's something that uh, Sajid Javid initially ruled out, said that renationalisation is not the answer, but the position now seems to be softening. Lewis, thank you. Right, still to come on the ITV Evening News. Still not quite sunk in yet, everything's still a bit surreal. Um, so, yeah, just um, enjoying, enjoy, enjoying wearing the green jacket. <laughs> Masters champion Danny Willett tells me how he can't wait to get home to his young family. I'm just looking forward to, to getting home and locking the door and throwing the key away for a week and um, turning my phone off and just enjoying spending time at home with, uh, with Nick and with Zach. And Prince William pays tribute to the boss. But who was he talking about? You'll find out. We have the rest of the day's news after the break. Welcome back. As much as anything else, it was the look of happy disbelief on Danny Willett's face that summed up what it meant to win one of golf's most coveted prizes. But the Yorkshireman's victory in the US Masters was no fluke. As others crumbled, the Briton produced a final round that was both nerveless and flawless. In a moment, we'll hear what he told Mark about his victory. But first, our sports editor Steve Scott reports on Britain's newest sporting superstar. The few hours sleep Danny Willett got last night will at least prepare him for life as a new dad. Gently, gently. Well done. Well done. In fact, he nearly missed the Masters completely, but baby Zach came along just in time. He said that had proved a calming distraction over the past few days. He was even on the phone to his wife when, after a nerve wracking wait, he realised no one left on the course could better his score. He's getting the <laughs> You dream about these kind of days and, and things like that, but for him to, to happen, you know, there's four a year. Um, so to actually be sat here is just, it's still mind boggling. Willett was in no small way helped by a meltdown from the man handing over the winner's green jacket, defending champion Jordan Spieth. Simply put, the Englishman held his nerve. Ooh, that's right. Oh. And that's water, and just like that. The world number two did not. If there was any anxiety burning inside him, you couldn't tell. Fantastic result. Willett's path to major success began here 17 years ago on family holidays in Anglesey, a nine-hole pitch and putt course golfers usually share with grazing sheep. My missus hates getting up on, on, in the morning on holiday. So I'd take all the kids to play golf every single morning. Very quickly at the age of probably 11, he, he was doing what he wanted to do with a ball, which as, as a hacker, I know how impossible that is. <laughs> a close family, one of Willett's three brothers, even bought young Danny his first set of clubs. I bought him them for Christmas. Unfortunately, I didn't make him sign anything <laughs> for any sort of future return, but it's, uh, it's fine. I've just What happened last night was more than enough. It was awesome. I'm so glad I did it now. Yeah, it's still not quite sunk in yet. Everything's still a bit surreal. As investments go, it turned out to be a pretty shrewd one. Enjoy, enjoy wearing the green jacket. Steve Scott, ITV News. Well, Danny says he has just one thing on his mind tonight, getting home to wife Nicola and his newborn son. He says he'll lock the door and throw away the key for a week. I spoke to him just before we came on air and asked him first about his night of celebration. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it wasn't quiet. Uh, no, it was. It was a good laugh. There was uh, a lot of people here. Um, a lot of people obviously wishing well and that had been following all week. Um, so just a really nice gathering. And when you eventually woke up, uh, did you have to go and check that the jacket was really there? Did you have to check that it all wasn't a dream? <laughs> 
First thing I did, got out of bed, made sure the jacket was still there. No one had come in and stolen it overnight. You're the only, the second Englishman to win it, of course, and at your second attempt, it's quite something. What does it mean to you, Danny? It really is a dream come true, you know. I've, I've dreamt of it in certain shots, you know, on the Sunday on the back nine at Augusta, and um, <laughs> yesterday, you know, I made that dream come true. Um, and, yeah, still not quite sunken in yet about what we've what we've just achieved and what it kind of means. Now, you must have got loads of messages overnight and this morning. What's the best message you've received and from who? Just from my wife, just saying, um, proud of you, regardless of if you'd have come last or first. Um, you know, proud of you, that's, that's kind of life, you know. That's luckily for me, that's what I'm able to go back to um, every week. Um, and that's what it's all about, you know, family and friends not really caring if you win or if you don't win. Um, just, just caring that um, you know that you did as good as you can and, and things like that. And um, fortunately enough, yesterday we were able to um, to do something really special. That's very true. Um, and all this on your wife's birthday. It was on the due date for your newborn son, Zacharias. He came early to let you play. It's almost almost too much to celebrate when you get home, isn't it? Yeah. Nick was obviously born today, and little man was was due today. Obviously, he came early to help his dad out. Um, yeah. Just just them <laughs> things really that kind of seems to fall into place really nicely. Yeah, and what are your plans now? To rush home, I assume, and see uh, your wife and Zacharias? Yeah, just looking forward to, to getting home and locking the door and throwing the key away for a week and um, <laughs> turning my phone off and just enjoying spending time at home with, uh, with Nick and with Zac. Your brother PJ was all over Twitter last night saying that he's shared a bath with a Masters champion and uh, he apparently punched you when you hurt his pet rat. Uh, what's your message to him? No, it's, it's funny. I've been reading through some of the bits. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to grow up with, uh, with two older brothers and one younger brother that um, made everything pretty tricky in life, you know, as, as older brothers do. Um, so, yeah, it's nice of him to, uh, to post it to the world, I guess. Danny, thank you very much. Congratulations. Uh, thank you for joining us and uh, very well right. done. Yeah, good luck to him. Now, 17 schools in Edinburgh are not reopening after the Easter holidays because of safety fears. It means about 7,000 pupils are likely to be affected by the closures, uh, with many of them due to sit important exams in just three weeks' time. Yeah, the schools were all built under a private finance programme and a deal signed with the council 15 years ago. Here's our Scotland correspondent, Peter Smith. School's out in Edinburgh, but it's not supposed to be. This was meant to be the first day back after a fortnight of Easter holidays, but at 17 of the city's schools, the only people you'll find in the playground are construction workers. The only tests being done are on the structural integrity of the buildings. Sophie Somerville should be in class finishing her coursework for hires, the Scottish equivalent of A-levels, but she's a pupil at Furhill High School, one of those built under a private finance initiative 10 years ago and now deemed possibly unsafe. So with just weeks to go before her exams, she's left at home to prepare by herself. It is a little bit frightening, really, because our exams are in three weeks or so. So, um, yeah, <laughs> it's quite daunting that we might not be able to finish these courses in time and, yeah, get what we need. Sophie's little brother goes to Oxgangs Primary, where a wall collapsed after storms in January. An investigation into that incident uncovered safety concerns across the city, and Edinburgh Council has announced 7,700 pupils, along with their teachers, now have to stay at home. But what we're doing right now is making sure we've got continuities on the basis that worst scenario is that we find faults in every school, uh, and if not, we'll be opening those schools as appropriate when they're safe. Um, for the pupils of Edinburgh. For now, Edinburgh City Council doesn't know how long the classrooms will remain empty and the Scottish Government doesn't know if other schools across the country might also be unsafe. Peter Smith, ITV News. Regulators in the EU are being urged to block a merger between the mobile phone networks 3 and O2. The Competition and Markets Authority says the £10 billion deal would harm competition in the UK market. And the death has been announced of Lady Melinda Rose Woodward, the wife of the singer Sir Tom Jones. She died from cancer on Sunday. Finally, the Queen's forthcoming 90th birthday dominated the second day of William and Kate's trip to India today. The royal couple went to an early birthday party in the Queen's honour in New Delhi. Yes, Prince William paid tribute to the Queen as very much the boss of the family firm. Our correspondent Geraint Vincent is with them. 
at the residence of the British High Commissioner in Delhi this evening, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge were the guests of honour at a slightly early 90th birthday party for Her Majesty the Queen. Now it's important that everyone here tonight understands that I am here as the Queen's representative. She may be my grandmother, but she's also very much the boss. <laughs> The Duke spoke of the Queen's great fondness for India, which she's visited three times over the course of her reign. I'm incredibly lucky to have my grandmother in my life. As she turns 90, she's a remarkably energetic and dedicated guiding force for her family. And I'm so glad that my children are having the chance to get to know the Queen. The Duke described how India's contribution to the Commonwealth was enormously important to his grandmother, and shortly after he and his wife arrived in the Indian capital, they paid tribute to the nearly 75,000 Indian soldiers who died fighting for the British Empire in the First World War. So much of this visit is about the history of the relationship between the UK and India. Well, the Duke and Duchess have come here to honour those for whom that relationship meant going to fight in a faraway war and never coming home. And the relationship has often been an uneasy one. India's independence from Britain was achieved only after a long struggle. The Duke and Duchess paid their respects to India's founding father, Mahatma Gandhi, following in his final footsteps and laying flowers at the spot where he was killed. They were serenaded as they did so by local school children. It was really amazing and she is really beautiful. <laughs> The Duke and Duchess want to build their own relationship with India to last long into the future. They've started by honouring its past. Geraint Vincent, ITV News, Delhi. Well, that's all for now. Julie Etching will be here with News at 10. But from all the team on the evening news, have a very good night. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.